Good evening. On behalf of the Student Academy of Doctors of Audiology, I would like to welcome you to today's Student Practice Management Webinar, Staffing and Scheduling in an Audiology Practice. My name is Stephanie Chayeski, and I am pleased to serve as today's course coordinator. I have just a few housekeeping reminders before we begin. If you have any technical challenges during the session, please use the chat feature to make me aware, and I will be glad to assist you. Please type your questions into the question queue, and they will be addressed by presenters at the end of the presentation. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for online viewing next week. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the course moderator for this session, Kate Witham, SATA board president and third year AUD student at Gallaudet University. Kate? Thank you, Stephanie. On behalf of the SATA board, I am excited for the opportunity to welcome AUD students from programs across the country to this session on staffing models and scheduling for an AUD practice. It is also my distinct pleasure to introduce today's course leaders, Dr. Brian Urban and Dr. Stacey Baldwin. Um, Dr. Brian Urban, AUD, is the president of Counselor and a former private practice owner in Evanston, Illinois. He is a past president of the Academy of Doctors of Audiology, an adjunct faculty member at Rush University, an advisory board member for Salas Osborne College of Audiology, and a distinguished fellow in the Audiology Academy of the National Academics of Practice. Dr. Baldwin has been with Associated Audiologists for over 15 years, specializing in hearing loss and oral rehabilitation, and is the clinical service director. Her Doctor of Audiology degree is from the University of Kansas, where she is now a clinical assistant professor and has an ad hoc graduate faculty appointment. She has taught audiology coursework and provides clinical instruction for students. Dr. Baldwin is a member of the Academy of Doctors of Audiology, holds a certificate of clinical competence in audiology from the American Speech-Language Hearing Association, and is a member of the Kansas Speech-Language Hearing Association, where she currently serves on the board as the legislative liaison for audiology. Dr. Baldwin coordinates the staff's efforts for all local and national legislative issues that pertain to our patients, providers, practices, or practice and the profession of audiology. And she serves as the audiology legislative liaison for KSHA. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Baldwin. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, Dr. Urban and I got the topic of staffing modules and or models and how you staff and schedule a clinic. Um, so that is what we're going to cover this evening. And then I added a couple of slides too on kind of our current situation with the national pandemic and how that's changed everybody's scheduling for clinics. You know, I when I first started working on this presentation, which was just a couple of weeks ago, life was normal and we were seeing full schedules and we had audiologist scheduled every day, all day long. And of course, now we are sitting here trying to figure out how we navigate this kind of ever changing role, which I think change has always been something in our field. You know, we've seen a lot of changes come and go with technology and well, many different things within audiology, but with scheduling, I feel like it's kind of stayed the same for a long time until now. So there's been a lot of new things that we have to kind of consider. So we'll, we'll touch on that just a little bit. Um, Steph, if you wanna advance the slide. So when it comes to opening up a, an audiology clinic and kind of private practice, there's a whole lot of things you have to consider. Um, certainly things like location and, and who's going to be a partner in this or how many investors are you going to have? What services are you going to offer? There's a whole lot of things that have to be decided. But for the purposes of this next hour, we're really going to just focus on how you staff an audiology clinic. Um, I kind of initially started looking to find out were there actual models that have been sort of published or formulas or standards or best practices. And I have to tell you, I really couldn't find any. So if any of you guys know of any official models that are out there, you might have to let me know. Um, but since I didn't find a lot of um, formal models on that, I really based this off of sort of my experience. Um, we staff, I'm the clinical service director for our practice and we have seven locations. Um, we currently have 13 providers and I think 14 administrative staff. So we run with about 30 different staff members across two states and seven cities. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty large organization. 
but we are private. We are held by just a family owns our practice. So we are not governed by any kind of hospital or manufacturer, which really allows us to be pretty flexible in how we set things up. So I can kind of give you some perspectives on what we've done. All of our clinics are scheduled slightly differently. So it gives us an opportunity to talk about a lot of different things to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So um, first couple of things you'll want to think through is how many providers do you need to plan for? How many patients do you expect to see? How many support staff do you need? And a lot of these variables are ones you might already know. You know, for example, you may already know that you're going to have three providers because there's three partners opening up a practice. But in other situations, it might just be you opening up a practice and you have to figure out how many providers to hire. So you've got to kind of consider what you're working with, um, which components are sort of set in stone versus which ones can be more flexible. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then also some about scheduling some administrative time because for every direct patient encounter, there's going to be a lot of things that have to happen behind the scenes as well. And then as I mentioned earlier, we'll kind of briefly touch on what happens when there's a, a national pandemic that drastically changes everything. Next slide. So I'm gonna start off with number of providers. Um, again, this is something that could be preset. You know, if you guys are opening up a practice and you have maybe three people that are going into practice together, then you already know that you're going to have three main providers. And then you're gonna have to figure out how to set up that practice around that as the backbone. Um, in other instances, you might just be a sole person opening up a practice and then you kind of have to figure out the number of providers. But either way, you've got to know how many providers you're gonna be working with before you can really start to set up your scheduling. Um, so essentially the number of providers really becomes the backbone for how you're gonna schedule your clinic. Uh, next slide. So, if you are the sole provider, um, in some ways you will have more flexibility, um, but you'll also have a lot more responsibility. Uh, running a practice does not just mean seeing patients. There are so many things that have to go on behind the scenes and you have to decide how you're going to fit that in. Um, you know, there's things like obviously things like scheduling appointments and sending hearing aids for repair and placing orders, but you're also going to have things like submitting claims and filling out paperwork, not to mention all of the legal stuff and HR and payroll. And so the question would be, are you going to try to do all of that or do you need someone to assist you with that? And assisting with those things doesn't just mean maybe administrative assistance. It might also be that you need to hire a hearing aid dispenser to help in the clinic, or maybe you need an audiology assistant or a technician. So We'll kind of talk a little bit later about all of the different roles you might hire for, but you're going to have to kind of define who is going to do what and make sure that those roles are have reasonable expectations for the amount of time that you want to spend. Uh, next slide. So as a group practice, or if you have more than one partner that's coming in together, um, it gets a little bit more complicated, I think, in how you're going to set this up. But it's going to be important to define early on, does everybody have the same roles and expectations? Um, is one person going to handle more of the clinic and one person going to handle more of the administrative time? And if it's set up that way, you got, you're going to have to think about compensation too, because certainly the one that's running the clinic and doing more of the clinical services will be the one that's actually generating revenue versus the person behind the scenes who is equally as valuable it's not going to look like that on the books. So not only do you have to figure out how you're going to schedule them, but you're going to have to look at how that compensation is going to play a role in that as well. Um, and certainly if you start off with that upfront, it's going to make your lives a whole lot easier as you go forward. Uh, next slide. And then, so there's a lot of roles within our field. Um, and I think they're not all very clearly defined. You know, right now in audiology, there's a lot of places that are hiring assistants and technicians um, to help with all of the clinical services and we're still developing a lot of universal standards and certifications for these roles there are a lot of issues with licensing laws in each individual state so you have to make sure that wherever you're practicing you understand whether or not those providers can be utilized and if so in what ways um, there's also issues with billing and reimbursement and especially if you've got third parties involved or insurance you've got to understand 
whether or not those providers can actually be providing clinical services or kind of how that needs to be set up. Um, I, I didn't put directly on this slide, but hearing aid dispensers is another one that a lot of times private practices will hire. So you'll have audiologists as well as hearing aid dispensers working together. Um, so just making sure that the patient's needs are met, but then also that those state legislative issues and licensing concerns are addressed as well as reimbursement will be important in that. Um, next slide. And then we move on to administrative support staff, um, which has to do with kind of how is the daily operations going to run? Who's going to answer the phone and schedule the appointments? Um, will that same person be responsible for checking patients in and out as they come and go from the clinic? Will they be processing payments or submitting insurance claims? You also have kind of what I call the behind the scenes part, the people that are running payroll and PTO and accounting and compensation and um, really all of the HR needs, employee concerns, things of that nature. And then also IT needs, which I'm sure Brian can talk about a little bit more in depth, but you know, these clinics today um, are not just pen and paper charts. You know, there's a whole lot of IT considerations that goes on. And I can tell you in my role overseeing all of our offices, I probably spend half my time dealing with some kind of IT situation. So a piece of equipment that goes down or the internet goes out or whatever. And so someone has to be available to help with all of those different aspects, not just being able to see that patient. Uh, next slide. So the big question, what's the ratio of support staff to providers? And I would love to tell you that I have some great bit of knowledge to give you on this, but I really have no idea. This is kind of a loaded question, and I feel like every clinic that I have been in has operated differently. Um, I'll give you some things that you can think through, you know, as you're designing kind of your business plans and what, what you might want to look for. Um, but there really is not an exact science on how many support staff you need for each provider. Um, single provider clinics, a lot of times they can get by with just one administrative person because they're only going to be checking in and out one patient, you know, every hour or so um, versus multiple provider clinics. There's going to be a lot more people coming and going. So um, it's also not as easy as kind of a one to one ratio. Um, I think I've got that. Hey, Steph, will you go to the next slide? Yeah. So. Um, Again, single provider clinics, it's a little bit easier to get away with kind of one administrative person, um, at least for things like scheduling appointments and checking patients in and out because the flow through the clinic isn't gonna be quite as busy. Um, but if you'll go to the next slide, when we get into multiple, oops, let's see. Um, there we go. When you get into um, multiple providers, you know, the question of does a one-to-one -one ratio always work? Um, and I think it certainly can, but in a lot of in a lot of instances, one administrative person might still be able to handle the flow of two providers, kind of depending on what the other things are that they're required to do. So if if all they're required to do is answer the phones and schedule the appointments and check people in and out, they probably can handle more than one provider. However, if that same person is also helping doing things like accounts payable or receivable, or they're dealing with, um, you know, submitting, submitting claims, things of that nature, you probably would have to look at bringing on another administrative person to help, and then maybe dividing out those roles would be more helpful. Um, the other part of this is, you know, as the owner of the practice or partners in the practice, do you want to be the one handling things like payroll and accounts payable and receivable and HR components, or do you want to be in the clinic seeing patients? And so I think as, as you start to think about that plan, that's really something that's important to, to look at. Uh, next slide. And then the question would be, would you either, ever have more administrative staff than providers? And I would say it oftentimes is the case. Um, you know, you have to consider who is kind of generating the revenue for the practice. And so if the provider is spending all of their time handling administrative components, unless they're doing it outside of clinic hours, that means they are spending their time not generating revenue. So I think the more tasks that you can um, delegate to other staff members, it allows you to have more direct patient contact, which at the end of the day really is the component that's going to be generating the revenue for your clinic. Um, 
Next slide. Um, the other question is, would you ever have more providers than support staff? And I'm gonna say not very often. Um, and I made the comment that, you know, especially if you'd like to retain your valuable employees, um, I would be careful with having significantly more providers than support staff. Because when you think about all of the things that have to happen for every patient encounter, there's actually more time spent on the things that happen pre-appointment and post-appointment. You know, pre-appointment, you have to have people answering the phones to schedule, maybe sending out new patient paperwork, verifying benefits, obtaining orders. Hopefully we won't have to do that much longer, but for now, um, we have all of these things that have to happen before you can even see the patient. And then on the back side, once that appointment is finished, you still have to do, you know, collecting co-pays or private pay for the appointment, submitting claims, completing all the third-party paperwork stuff. Um, so really out of every patient encounter, there's actually more time spent probably on the front end and the back end than there is actually in the room with the patient. So it would be challenging to have a lot more providers and a lot fewer support staff. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to kind of list out some of the things that you might consider about all of the different types of roles you might have in your practice. Certainly you're going to have the audiologist or audiologist plural, and then you may consider things like a hearing aid dispenser, audiology assistant or technician. Oftentimes you'll need at least a receptionist so that there's somebody there to greet those patients when they're arriving. You might need an appointment scheduler, depending on if that's going to be the receptionist or potentially somebody outside of the clinic that's handling that for you. You're going to need claims administrators, um, people that are going to be able to file those claims to insurance companies. Um, a lot of times you'll have some form of an accountant that's doing accounts payable and receivable. Um, and, you know, for accounts payable and receivable, for those of you who maybe haven't covered that yet, that's going to be things like Paying payables is going to be, you know, you have to pay off your manufacturer's invoices. You, depending on how you're set up, you might have your rent or utility payments, but things that you're going to have to pay out in order to run your clinic. And then receivable is going to be collecting those funds on the backside from things like third parties, you know, people that owe you money. So there's, there's money coming and going kind of at all times. Uh, you might need an HR manager, you know, in a company that's, that's fairly large. If you have a lot of employees, you're going to need somebody to manage all of the different HR concerns from paperwork to paid time off, um, employee concerns or complaints. Um, you might have an office manager who kind of runs the office side of things. And then sometimes and oftentimes you'll have, you know, president, CEO, CFO, COO. So those are going to be things like chief executive officer, chief financial officer, or chief operating officer. Um, and this is just kind of the few that I could think of. You, you may build your practice in a way that combines some of these, or you may actually have more rules than this, just depending on how it's set up and the size. Um, next slide, please. So once you know how many providers you're going to have, the next question becomes, how are you going to set up their schedules? Again, you really have to consider how many roles they're going to have. Um, so for the purposes of this discussion, I'm really going to just talk about scheduling the providers, not necessarily scheduling other staff members. But a couple of things that you keep in mind is depending on the size of the practice and the number of patients you see and number of claims you process, it might not be that every single person has the same set number of hours per week. What I mean by that is the person who is your receptionist probably does need to be there for however many hours the provider is seeing patients because they need to be there to greet the patients. But for maybe the person that's processing your claims, it might be that you only have a few hours a day or a few days a week that you need somebody to process the claims. So I would definitely keep in mind that not all of your of staff has to work the exact same hours as your providers. Um, but for the purposes of what we're going to discuss tonight, I'm going to primarily talk about scheduling your providers. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So some things to think about for patient appointments and kind of how long those should be. Um, again, in every patient encounter, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen on the back side of things. So you have to decide, is your provider expected to do the entire appointment on their own um, or will they have people assisting them? And that's both in terms of 
having them help having help on the clinic. For example, if they're going to have an audiology assistant or a technician with them, they may be able to overlap their schedules. So one person will actually do the diagnostic testing while the audiologist is maybe doing a consult, and then they'll take over after the diagnostic test is done. They'll kind of switch patients. So you got to kind of figure out how many providers and how that looks really before you can design your schedule. And then you also have to consider if you have more than one audiologist or more than one provider in the same office, making sure you have the right number of patient rooms with the right amount of equipment. Um, if, you're, if you've got two providers, but one room has testing equipment and one room might have fitting equipment, you really have to make sure that's scheduled appropriately. And a lot of the office management systems out there, this is another part that Dr. Urban could certainly talk on, is capable of sort of scheduling, setting up a scheduling matrix so that you're not double booking those rooms or those resources that you have. Um, and then also in terms of scheduling them, one other comment is if you do have more than one provider and only one administrative person at that location, you want to be careful scheduling everybody on the same schedule. What I mean by that is you don't want three people checking in at 10 o'clock. You may need to do a 9.45, a 10, and a 10.15 so that your administrative person isn't trying to check in three people at the same time or check out three people at the same time. Uh, next slide. And then how long should each appointment be? Um, lots of things to consider with this too. So the question would be, is that patient appointment supposed to be just the direct patient contact? Or does it need to allow enough time to include everything, such as the documentation, things like placing orders, um, sending in repairs? possibly following up with a physician, those sorts of things. Um, and again, this still sort of ties back into, are you going to have someone helping you do that? Or is the provider responsible for all of that? Those are the things that will have to be factored into kind of how long those appointments should be. So if we go to the next slide, I'll kind of show you an example of what I mean by that. Um, for many of you, you've already been in clinics or doing um, externships somewhere, and you've probably seen that any type of appointment could have more than one duration depending on where you're at. For example, if we take something like a new patient hearing test in a single provider clinic, you could make a case that that appointment duration needs to be 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. And what really is going to dictate that is what are you expected to do in that time? If all you need to do is complete the diagnostic evaluation and maybe a case history, you can probably do that in 20 to 30 minutes. But if you're also needing to do a hearing aid consult or maybe complete reports that go back to physicians, submit claims, place hearing aid orders, all of those things, all within that appointment time slot, you probably are going to have to make that a little bit longer to maybe 60 or 90 minutes. So you've got to kind of keep that in mind. Now, if you were going to employ maybe an audiology assistant who might do the testing part and maybe they do the documentation and the ordering and all you're doing is the consult part, you might be able to change it to maybe 45 minutes. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do even just one single appointment type, there could be a lot of ways to do that. Um, if we look at the next slide, another example of that's a hearing aid fitting. So you might be able to make a case that a hearing aid fitting should be done in maybe only 30 minutes, um, or maybe it takes 60. Again, depends on what you're going to do. Um, if you are doing the entire thing and you've got to be able to do all of the initial fittings, the programming, all the verification, and then you're going to be the one consulting on use and care and all the documentation, you probably are going to have to allow longer than somebody who maybe has an assistant or someone with them where you could do just the initial fitting and then someone else could step in and handle all of the orientation and sort of things that go on after the fact. And then there's, of course, some other considerations to what type of hearing aid is it? You know, are you going to have to worry about changing two or three different domes before you get the feedback test that you want. All of those things can alter that duration quite a bit. Um, so those are the things that would have to be kind of considered. And I think another important comment about this is this is where educating your staff is gonna be really useful. You wanna to try to make your scheduling as simple as possible, but also make it where it's efficient. You need to make sure that your scheduling staff understands what it is that they're scheduling so that your schedule will be as efficient as possible. Um, you don't wanna necessarily have every single fitting be scheduled for 60 minutes if you know that some of them can be done significantly quicker or if you're going to use an assistant to consult you know, after your components are finished. Uh, next slide. 
So once you know how many providers you have and what your appointment durations are going to be, the next question would be, how do you set that up? Um, are you going to have a matrix that says you're only going to see new patients maybe a certain time of day or a certain day of the week? Or are you going to have people just sort of schedule whenever they'd like? There are definitely pros and cons to both of these options. And, you know, technology has been a really great thing for this. Um, you know, systems that we have in place, you know, such as Council Ear are able to actually design matrices for you so that your schedulers can very easily see you know, can they schedule a new patient here? Can they schedule a hearing aid fitting here? And those matrices can actually take into account all of the things we've already talked about. How long does the appointment need to be? What type of room does it need? Does it need an assistant? Those sorts of things. Um, but in terms of a matrix that dictates when you see a certain type of appointment, um, there certainly are pros and cons. You know, the matrix is helpful. If you've got more than one provider in the same clinic, you can make sure that you're not overlapping or double booking rooms but it's a little bit more limiting in terms of patient flexibility. Um, so if patients you know, are calling in for a new patient appointment and you've got a whole bunch of openings for fits, but the new patients are having to wait several weeks, that really doesn't make sense either. So um, on this next slide here, I mentioned briefly kind of about a matrix or a uh, slash open hybrid. And what I mean by that is it might be that you hold certain slots each week for some of those longer things like a new patient appointment or a fitting, um, but maybe you don't matrix the entire schedule. That way you kind of have some time set aside where you know you can fit in those longer appointments and the rest of the time can be sort of free schedule or open schedule for whatever needs to be, whatever patients are needing to get into the clinic. Um, next slide. The other component, and I, it's kind of ironic that I put this under scheduling, but are you gonna see walk-ins? Um, I realize that the whole idea of a walk-in is that it is not scheduled, um, but not every clinic can handle a walk-in if the schedule is booked to the point where they're booked back to back. So I think your clinic will need to decide if you are going to see walk-ins, and if so, what will that look like? You know, Will you just see them kind of any time of day depending on when they come in? Or one of the things that has worked for our clinic and it took us a while to get it advertised is we have sort of set times for walk-ins. So we have a period of time every morning and every afternoon um, where we will take walk-ins. They walk into the office. They basically check their hearing aid in over the counter. We fix everything or do what needs to be done in the lab and then give them back to us or give them back to the patient. That allows us to sort of see patients without appointments that need to be seen quickly, but also at a time where we can kind of control how many people are in the clinic and do we have enough providers available to service those when they do walk in. Um, of course, not everybody walks in during the time we have set aside, which is where this drop-off idea comes from. Um, we allow patients to drop off their hearing aids. So if they just walk into our clinic, but all of our providers are already seeing scheduled patients, they're able to drop off their devices. We will get to them in between patients as we can and then return them to them. So I realize walk-ins isn't exactly something you schedule, but I think thinking through how that will fit into your schedule is important because no matter what you want, you will have people walking in and kind of expecting to be seen when they would like to be seen. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things I was asked was about how many patients can a provider see? So what is a realistic expectation? Well, it's a really wide range. Um, I can tell you that overseeing seven different locations, it, it just, it varies greatly. And in most of our clinics, we are booked solid from eight to five, five days a week. But even being booked solid, we might see anywhere from five or six patients a day all the way up to 20 or 25 a day, even with the whole patient day being filled. Because some days you're going to have more of those longer appointments and see fewer patients. And some days you're going to have 20 patients with hearing aid problems that you might only spend 10 or 15 minutes with those patients, but you're going to see a lot more of them. Um, so really your number of patient encounters or patients that you could see can really range anywhere from as low as 25 or 30 up to well over 100, all with the same amount of patient contact, just depending on what kind of combinations you're seeing. So, you know, how do you estimate that when you're designing your business plans? Um, I would say most of the time, you know, you have to have kind of a balance of both. I think 25 to 100 is obviously one extreme to the next. It's rare that you're going to have 25 patients a week, and it's rare that you're going to have over 100. So somewhere in the middle is probably what's going to happen most of the time. Um, so if you advance to the next slide, 
a couple of things to kind of keep in mind when you're setting up these expectations is that new patient appointments certainly take a much longer chunk, but that also means that for every new patient you see, particularly if you sell them a hearing aid, you're gonna be growing your patient database. So every time you fit a new patient with new hearing aids or a new patient to your clinic, you're adding to the amount of routine care or maybe smaller, shorter reoccurring appointments that you're gonna need to see each week. So it's certainly possible that when you're a newer audiologist or a newer clinic, the majority of your days will be spent on hopefully new patients and fittings. But then as time goes on, you're going to need to build in enough time that you can maintain all of the routine maintenance that ne that's necessary for those patients to continue being successful. And then on the next slide, I just briefly talked a little bit about a couple of other things that when you're looking at scheduling services, you wanna consider uh, vestibular appointments. You know, if you're gonna offer vestibular services, um, a lot of the same principles that we've already talked about will apply. Some appointments will be longer, others are going to be shorter. But one of the big differences to consider with vestibular patients is they are oftentimes going to be a single encounter. They might have one or two follow-ups, you know, certainly for something like BPPV, you might have some follow-up appointments or recurrences. But with each vestibular patient, you're not necessarily going to need long-term or routine appointments to kind of go with that. So vestibular sort of will always be more often than not longer appointments that aren't necessarily recurring. Um, tinnitus services are kind of the same way. Um, a lot of the tinnitus evaluations and consults are sort of one or two time things. However, they do tend to result in hearing aid fittings or some type of tinnitus masking devices that will need long-term or routine care. So I think in terms of estimating how many patients you'll see, tinnitus services oftentimes sort of mimics or follows hearing aid scheduling a little bit closer than vestibular might. And then on the next page, I also just briefly touched on things like hearing conservation services, you know, for musicians or occupational or re uh, recreational noise exposure, things like legal ser services and expert witnesses. Um, I'm kind of continue to be surprised how often this comes up, but in our clinic, we actually have to schedule time to do phone calls with lawyers um, or serve as expert witnesses on all kinds of cases. Um, so all of those are things that you'll need to plan for now things like serving as an expert witness or legal services is not something that's probably gonna routinely happen in your clinic, but if you're getting those cases, you're gonna to need to set aside time to, to work on those because getting that done in between appointments is gonna be challenging. And other things that you might wanna consider like community awareness and screenings. Um, a lot of clinics will work with outreach facilities, retirement homes, um, things of that nature, and all of those things would wanna be incorporated into your schedule. Uh, next slide. And I'm gonna kind of kind of go quickly through this next couple slides um, so we have time to listen to Dr. Urban, but um, do you need to schedule admin time? This is a big question and a lot of it has to do with how long are your appointment durations? You know, are you scheduling those appointments for a long enough duration that allows you to complete all of those administrative things within that time? Or are those appointments scheduled shorter and kind of back to back? So you're going to have follow up at the end of every day or maybe at the end of each half day. Um, the other part is, are you managing the business side? And if so, that's also going to take some time. So you'll want to make sure that you really think through how that's being done. Otherwise, you will be giving up all of your evenings and weekends, making sure that you get the back side done um, if it's not allotted for in your clinic day. Uh, next slide. So you set up your schedule. You know exactly what it's going to look like. Are you ever going to need to change it? Even prior to three weeks ago when all of this COVID stuff started, I would have told you that you need to be flexible. Every clinic is different. Um, I mentioned earlier, we operate seven different locations um, and that spans across two states and seven different cities. And every single one of my clinics is scheduled differently. So we have a clinic that is set up, they all sort of start the same. So we kind of start with the same scheduling matrix and then sort of see where it takes us. So we have one clinic that is in um, Leavenworth, Kansas, which is a huge military town. There's a military base there. So that office does a lot more TRICARE things and military testing. We have another office that is located in Western Kansas. Um, and so that provider actually has to drive out. So she drives out to a lot of different cities that have very limited healthcare. So her schedule looks really different than patients coming to the clinic. She's oftentimes going out to them. And then we have several offices that are in more of a suburban or metropolitan area that's 
maybe a little bit more routinely scheduled. But of all seven of our offices, they all look very different. We also have a lot of differences across providers. I have some providers that are really efficient. Um, they can see a lot more patients per hour and still get all of their administrative stuff done. Certainly newer providers need a little bit more time to kind of catch up. I have some providers who prefer to schedule a chunk of admin time at the end of every day so that they can wrap up all their notes and they just see kind of their patients in a shorter amount. And I have other people that want to be able to do their documentation and follow up right when that appointment concludes. And so their appointments might be staggered a little farther apart. But be open to changing because what is efficient and best for one provider or one location is not always going to be the same across all providers in all locations. Um, and then there's the big, the big what if that I don't think anybody could have planned for. So I just have a couple of real brief slides here. Um, thanks, Steph. On COVID-19 and what in the world do you do when all of a sudden in what seemed like a matter of 24 hours, you go from having a completely full schedule and people happily coming into your clinics to people being told that they need to stay at home and businesses being told that they probably need to close. Um, what do you do? Do you close your doors or do you operate business as usual? And I think the vast majority of people would probably say that you're going to be best served if you find a middle ground. It's going to be best for your business and best for your patients. But then the question came up to tell you, you know, are audiology services essential? And I know we're probably have people from kind of all over the United States. Um, I'm in Kansas. Um, Kansas has been on a mandatory 30 day lockdown. So only essential services can be provided. But the definition of essential is pretty vague. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, Steph. So what we decided at the clinic, and I'm just going to give you just a brief, um, I guess, description of what we're doing. So if this ever happens, you guys can kind of have some ideas. But we kind of thought through really what is an essential service. And I realize that audiology services are not life and death, right? They're not critical care. However, there are a lot of things about them that are essential to a lot of patients. Um, there's some of the obvious ones, you know, like sudden onset hearing loss, whether it's a sensory neural loss that needs a steroid injection or whether it's a conductive loss that's going to need, you know, treatment for ear infections. Those are things that really need to be treated quickly, especially a sudden onset loss that, you know, really would benefit from steroid treatment because those really need to be done within a couple of weeks in order for them to be effective. So waiting would really put that patient's long-term hearing in jeopardy. And then you've got people that have significant hearing loss that really impacts their communication ability. Um, you know, if they've got a severe hearing loss and really cannot function without the use of their hearing aid or their cochlear implant, they're not gonna be able to communicate with doctors and emergency personnel. So there are essential pieces of audiology that I think we have to remember. Um, and then, you know, vestibular concerns that might affect people's ability to perform daily functions. And I've had countless people calling over the last week because their tinnitus has suddenly gotten much, much worse. Well, I would, I would guess that the tinnitus itself or any physiological changes probably haven't, but certainly the stress and the distress of the current situation is making that tinnitus seem a whole lot worse. So for some patients, that is certainly an essential thing for, to them. Um, on the next slide, um, you, you know, there's ways that you can do this so that you're not just letting your clinic stay wide open and be flooded with patients. Um, you can do all kinds of things like scheduling. What we're doing in our office right now is we only see patients face to face in the clinic if we absolutely have to. And those patients are being triaged by our providers. We're making sure that they've passed healthcare screenings and that we're using good sanitation practices and personal protective equipment, you know, as we can. Um, but for those patients that need it, I think, I think we owe it to them to kind of come up with some ways to help, help the patient while we're minimizing the risk and following our state guidelines. Um, on the next slide, the other thing that you could consider is some alternatives. Um, you can have drop box things where you can have people actually drop off hearing aids in a lock box. Um, we're actually using a curbside drive through now. So um, most of our offices are on hospital campuses and we're kind of told who can and can't come in the building. And so we are literally seeing patients out their car window, which is very unique and very strange, but it is helping a lot of people. Um, and then of course, there's all kinds of neat things you can do over the phone or email or video conferencing. So kind of have to think outside the box when something new is thrown your way. 
So I know I went kind of quick there at the end, but I want to get this turned over to Dr. Urban. Um, if you guys have questions, just type them in the box. And then as soon as Dr. Urban is done, we're happy to stick around and answer them. All right. Thanks, Dr. Baldwin. Uh, I'm going to flip my screen over here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for the chance to chat. Um, I guess it's in presentation mode. So, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, so uh, counselors, my company, obviously, we're not going to be talking about counselor, but um, just to kind of highlight that I, I, I tend to think about things from a system function and not just how, like, you know, technology functions as part of it, but also the overall workflow. So, how different um, types of efficiencies can help the entire system. And by that, I mean from the moment the patient, uh, potential patient becomes aware of your clinic, all the way through the process of processing claims or fitting devices and follow-up care and long-term connecting with patients. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do along the way that keep that in, in you know, kind of in one um, uh, cohesive flow. And the reason I bring that up is that gets right into staffing. It gets into how you run your practice because um, you certainly don't want to be overstaffed, right? You don't, or you don't want to be understaffed. You want to be rightly staffed and you want everyone to be working up to their fullest capabilities. Uh, you don't need someone sitting there who only answers the phone and the phone rings 10 times a day and the rest of the time they're twirling their thumbs, right? And you're paying them and you're annoyed that they're not doing work, but you never gave them any work, right? So uh, there's a lot that can be done um, uh, through systems uh, that help you figure a lot of this out. So I'm just going to kind of mention some areas. A lot of this kind of speaks for itself. So um, I won't go into great detail, but once again, if you have any questions, um, let me know. All right, so let's talk about automation first. Uh, the idea overall is to increase patient access and decrease staff workloads. The idea is to make it easier for patients, make it easier for staff, right? Just that whole process, make that simpler. So oftentimes they can start with online scheduling, right? Giving the patient the ability to go to your website, uh, respond to direct patient emails, click a link, right? Social media ads or through patient portal and schedule their appointments, right? So uh, there are certain clinics that we work with uh, that have gone to almost exclusively patient self-scheduling. Now, uh, some of these clinics tend to work more like, more like musicians, and so it's not necessarily a typical patient population, um, but you'd be amazed the number of patients that will self-schedule or their kids will self-schedule for them, right? So the patient's 89, but the daughter's 61, and so she would love to schedule online. That's how she does it for her dentist and you know, optometrist and for her primary care. So uh, you can give those abilities, and then you're not always focused on answering the phone. Um, also, are there ways that we can just make that whole process easier where there's not a heavy paper load and we're getting work done before the patient arrives? So uh, having the ability for online you know, questionnaires, of course, this all has to be HIPAA compliant, but have the patient be able to fill this information out in advance, right? And just to give you a, a sense of this, so when I started my private practice, I bought my private practice, I should say, I bought a very small private practice. And the audiologist I bought it from, she was uh, in her like uh, mid to late 70s. And, and the agreement was she was supposed to stay on for one year and kind of act as my, my front office manager. And then potentially, you know, there's an option for a second year. Well, we signed the contract and pretty much she was gone. <laughs> that was pretty much like uh, within a few days, uh, she just didn't show up anymore. Um, so we had different uh, ideas about what that agreement meant. And it was all fine and well, but it didn't mean for about six months I was solo, you know, and then I had to find that balance of seeing patients versus answering the phone. Um, and then eventually, of course, I hired a front office manager. So if I, at that time, had had a lot of these online systems, it would enable me to be much more productive you know, lower the call volume, lower the, here I'm giving you a paper clipboard, or a clipboard with paper on, now you fill it out and I have to re-enter it in the system. So once again, these systems can be helpful for individuals or for groups. Uh, also, of course, you can have outcome surveys as part of that as well. Um, once again, the idea is increase patient access, decrease staff workload. So one of the simple things, you can have automated confirmations. Once again, you're not calling the patient every single time. You're emailing, you're texting, you're call messaging, and then the patient can confirm the appointment through any one of those methods, right? So simple things. And once again, these are all things that patients now are very much accustomed to. We're accustomed to it, right? We, we receive these, we respond to these. Um, and it just, once again, takes an extra step out of the process. Uh, also, you know, obviously a very hot topic now, which is telehealth. The ability to use visual, uh, video conferencing, so HIPAA compliant systems where you can set things up on demand, so, hey, I've got a patient who called in. They're having trouble putting their battery in. 
do I schedule an appointment for that patient? Uh, have them arrange travel, uh, perhaps once again using their daughter who takes off from work that brings the patient in. Uh, we sit down, we block a half hour time slot for a clean and check. Uh, patient comes in, we determine pretty quickly it's just a matter of the battery, right? They're using their batteries from their last hearing instruments instead of this current, uh, you know, for uh, the current uh, hearing instruments. Whereas if we were able to fire up a quick, you know, telehealth session with a patient, with their daughter, we might just take a look and go, oh, use the one with the brown stickers. Oh, that's what the problem was, right? There can be very quick solutions. Obviously, this can also play into longer conversations. Dr. Barr will talk about tinnitus uh, rehab counseling and other ways to connect with patients. Uh, telehealth is something that right now, once again, has gotten a lot of attention, but it's, I think, one of the things that will come out of uh, this whole, you know, uh, crisis of COVID-19 is I think telehealth is here to stay in, in a, a very significant way. Um, so this allows you to chat, right? So you can type on the screen at the same time, you can screen share. So it's a very interactive, you know, experience for patients, right? And once again, they're doing this with their primary care right now. So we're not breaking new ground with this. We're actually just getting, you know, as a profession, getting up to speed with this. Um, so giving the patient what they want. And obviously, as I mentioned, you can be HIPAA compliant. You know, most of these systems avoid the need to have setups, right? So the patient can click a link and be right into the webinar. Uh, or into the uh, telehealth session. And then of course, all the major manufacturers of hearing instruments now have remote programming, so you can couple these together. In some cases, you can go right through the manufacturer's you know, app on the phone, and you've got the screen share plus the programming capabilities. In other cases, it's more generic where you can program and you wanna supplement that with uh, a, a, a video conferencing system. Um, whatever's needed on the fly there, right? Uh, by the way, you also can schedule them typically with most systems. So you can actually build it right into your system. And uh, if you put this in with um, this next part here, we're talking about, uh, or actually I, I forgot to add in there, sorry, online scheduling, you can have the patient, um, or I'm sorry, I mentioned before, you can have the patient go into your website, schedule an appointment online, schedule for a telehealth session. When it comes time, you can fire up the telehealth, they fire up the telehealth, right? That whole uh, process was set up completely online, right? So once again, if you're thinking about staffing, there are ways to make that very, very efficient. Now, of course, there's also follow-up because it's not just about answering the phone and making confirmation calls. It's that how do we stay in touch with these patients long-term? So some touch points, um, you can have automated patient reviews. Uh, I suspect in, you know, I, I believe you have a marketing uh, type webinar uh, as part of this series. Well, one of the things is that patient reviews is one of the best ways to get your search rankings up. Well, it's a challenge if you're trying to gather those reviews onesie twosie style, right? It takes a lot of time, it's not easy. So you, the systems are, are very much in place to enable you to get automated reviews. You see a patient, you set that patient um, encounter as complete in a system, and it sends out a review request to that patient really efficient way for getting lots of great reviews. Uh, as we all know, I mean, we're all consumers. One of the first things I do when I'm looking at a, a restaurant or a product or something is I do some searches online and I look for reviews, right? So even as an early practice, right? If you're, if, you, if you're kind of thinking this process starting from scratch or maybe buying a small practice, those reviews can have a huge impact on your growth. So making that automated all the better. Also marking automation. So having triggers within any system that you use that can routinely reach out to patients, right? Sending emails out for their birthday, sending them out for warranty expiration, if they're tested not treated patients, you know, send those, those triggers out as well, uh, canceled emails, no shows, those types of things that typically, once again, you may have a staff member there who's picking up the phone every time. And, and that's not bad, but in a practice, you'll notice that a lot of those routine activities, sometimes they fall through the cracks. I got too busy, I didn't make the warranty calls this month. Oh, well, that's a problem. We need patients to, you know, to get their warranty emails, right? We want them to know what's going on. Um, when you set that up as, as, as an automated process, it obviously just happens, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, some other scheduling considerations, uh, and, and Dr. Baldwin touched on a, a fair amount of this, so I won't go into too much detail on this, but Obviously, block scheduling can be a good idea. Uh, now, when I started my practice, I pretty much, you know, I, I read some stuff on block scheduling, and I was like, you know what? 
I will see any patient anytime and, and whenever. So <laughs> I tried buck scheduling and then realized it, 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 it was out of the gate. It didn't necessarily work for me. But as I got a little bit busier and I hired a second audiologist and a third audiologist, then I was like, oh, we do need to make sure we can get new patients in, right? Or have time for vestibular or whatever the case may be. So it may not be something immediately, but something you look towards the future for. Um, but it is important to schedule admin time. And not that you wouldn't have time right out of the gate, but the thing is, if you don't schedule it, it doesn't happen. And that's the challenge. Oh, I'm gonna work on these things. Yeah, I need to do that's in the back of your head. But unless you actually block time for you to actually not just you know uh, actually work on the practice, not just work in the practice. The focus is oftentimes just in making the immediate stuff happen, right? Get those repairs out, uh, see that patient, uh, call about the the new device that hasn't arrived yet. And not to say you don't need to do that stuff, but if you're not actually spending time working on your marketing plan, it doesn't happen. If you're not spending time working on you know social media uh, posts or, or the planning events outside of your space, it doesn't happen. Now, one really good book about this is called The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Uh, really interesting read because he this is all about this concept here about actually working on the practice. It's a pretty quick read, uh, so you probably have a lot of you know work to do for school and stuff. You're not looking for additional reads, but just maybe one to put on your list. Um, and it's the kind of book, once again, you can leave through it pretty quickly and I think get a lot of really good content uh, pretty quickly. All right, now you also want to spend time with outreach, and this is talking about referral activities. Once again, this could be a staff member. Uh, in some cases, clinics can contract the people who do this for you. You might be doing this yourself, right? So if you have more things automated, it gives you more time to work on your referral opportunities. So we're talking about talking to senior living facilities. So this is something where uh, you don't necessarily have to have extended staff there. Maybe you just go there. Uh, and in my case, there were three senior facilities within three blocks of my office. And so I was able to establish connections with those facilities. Uh, in one case, I had weekly office hours, like a three hour segment. On uh, the other two places, it was, uh, I think it was once a month, right? But a really cheap way for uh, getting new patients. Uh, also helping patients that were already there because uh, I, especially when I went there every week, I had a lot of patients that lived at that facility. Well, what we did is we scheduled 10 minute time slots. They would pop down, I'd do a quick cleaning check. They knew it was 10 minutes, right? Pop in, how you doing, what's going on? Change some wax guards, uh, you know, chat them up for a minute and they'd walk out and the next patient would walk in. Well, I could clear six patients in an hour, right? Write up quick chart notes and I was out and hopefully pick up a patient or two during that time. Uh, but then it meant those same six, six patients would have typically scheduled six half hour appointments in my office. So a pretty dramatic difference in my overall um, you know, efficiency there, and I didn't have to have any additional staff, right? It was just me going to that facility. Yes, there was someone back in the office, you know, answering calls and that type of stuff, but it didn't require a great level uh, of uh, administrative support. Um, obviously, reaching out to physicians is important. Um, there's different ways you can do that. One of the biggest ways is just through your reports. So making sure that your professional reports are, are being sent out in a professional way and in a timely fashion. That's your best handshake for a physician or physician's office. Am I getting you high quality reports quickly, right? You're making their job easier, you're impressing them. It's super important. So you wanna think about that and it, you know, once again, this, we're talking about larger systems, but not just physicians. We're talking about chiropractors, PTs, dentists, mental health therapists. Um, we started approaching my practice where we reached out to professionals like this in my area and I started getting all kinds of different referrals. You know, it wasn't a ton, by the way, but some. And and some of them were because we offered, you know, uh, vestibular uh, services, right? And you don't even necessarily have to offer the full gamut of vestibular services. You can buy a massage table for $250 and perform BPV evaluations and treatment, right? That's largely private pay. Uh, it, you know, it depends on obviously the patient's policy, but if they are Medicare, for example, it could be private pay. I had a whole series of chiropractors that they would go to do a treatment on a patient, they'd get dizzy and the patient would end up in my office, right? Cost me zero dollars to get that patient in. Um, same thing went for mental health. It would come up during conversations that the patient struggled from dizziness. Obviously dentists, they put people back a lot too, right? So uh, simple things like that. Now PTs, it all just depends on if they do it themselves, right? They may already do it in some cases they don't. They may, may not have a specialty in vestibular treatment. Um, you also wanna spend some time reaching out to Costco. Uh, because you can supplement. So if you, what Costco does is they do not work with patients that have 
concerns of tinnitus. Uh, my understanding is they do very few uh, or none at all custom devices. Um, certainly they're not going to be working with patients with vestibular issues or things like that. So you can actually be, um, I've heard some many clinics working in a constructive fashion with a cost go down the street. Once again, all this isn't designed to make patients uh, arrive at your front door easier, right? You're not necessarily paying a staff member to be doing all this creative work on newspaper ads and things. You're establishing some systems where you're getting a continual uh, patient flow, right? Low cost of acquisition for that patient. And ideally, you're getting, you know, a couple patients a month from the senior facility and you work with a whole series of different physicians and one physician is giving you one per month and that one's giving you one per six months and you know or 10 six, 10 physicians give you one every six months right but it really starts to add up and so the more you can do to help those uh, patients get to you easier and if you can make it easier for these you know for the senior facility hey if anyone ever has any concerns about you know the hearing issues have them click this link and they can schedule online, right? Or the, in this case, the facility can help them as well. Same thing goes for the other professionals as well. Um, but the idea, once again, is to focus on how you can build systems in to make, to take the workload off of your staff, to make it easier for patients to get to you. And then if you think about kind of everything I talked about from the patient perspective, making that whole process nice and smooth. So, because uh, one of the big problems in practice as the practice grows, a lot of ancillary staff starts to get uh, built in and it just gets harder. I mean, Stephanie can talk about this well, managing an organization, you know, or a large organization herself. When you start managing more people, and, and of course, Dr. Baldwin can as well, you, you get presented with new challenges. As a business owner, it's not just now I'm an audiologist and I own a business, it's I'm an audiologist, I own a business, now I need to manage staff. Right, and, and that brings its whole level of things. So the more you can do to automate things, the more you can do to make the process express, uh, hopefully uh, you, can, you can keep high level, high quality, motivated staff and keep only the specific, the minimum amount that you need. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Urban, and thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Those were fantastic, very informative presentations. Um, I do have a couple of questions in the queue and a couple in chat. So I'm gonna start with a, a, one of the ones in the chat box. Um, how do I know when it's time to hire another administrator or clinician? Is there sort of a capacity rule of thumb that you guys look at um, where you don't want people to be overwhelmed, obviously, but you don't want them sitting around either? Um, this is Dr. Baldwin. I'm happy to kind of take that. I don't think that there's a great formula for it. I think you will certainly know. And I honestly think your administrative staff will tell you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think, well, your administrative staff will certainly let you know when they're starting to get overwhelmed. And I think you'll be able to see that. Now, from a provider standpoint, you have to look at how long do you want patients waiting and how long are patients willing to wait. Um, and that might depend on where your location is. You know, some of my clinics that are in more rural areas, those patients are used to having to wait maybe a week to two weeks to be seen because they are used to not having a lot of providers concentrated in one location. On the other hand, my clinics that are in much busier kind of metropolitan areas, if you can't see that patient within maybe three to five business days, they will go somewhere else. So you have to kind of look at how long your patients are waiting and where you're located to figure out if that's going to work. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things we use for when we know it's time to add a provider or a location. Yeah, and I think, right, staff will tell you, uh, also you need to be asking them. So this is something I learned gradually in my practice, and I've, I've tried to employ this more with counselors, is, is checking in and finding out what their work levels are. Because one of the challenges is if you're in and out uh, with patients, let's say you have a busy day, and you're actually only in that front office space for like 20 minutes, perhaps the whole day, right? Just getting patients and then bring you back or maybe a half hour. And so your sample of the busyness of that front office manager is not terribly good usually. Um, and so it, you can lead to some assumptions like, oh, I came out once and they were checking their email. Oh, they must not have the work to do. Well, that was, that was one. And maybe they are slacking off, who knows? But, um, or maybe they don't have enough to do but you're not getting a good sample. So I, I, I make a point to check with my staff routinely. Um, and generally speaking, I will say from like our, our, the counselor side of things, we want people to be, and this is, this is generic, so don't, this isn't gospel, but um, we want people to be about 80% busyness. I don't want people on the phone 
all the time, right? Because their quality is going to start to degrade. They're going to start to not like their job, honestly. So people need that ability to transition between activities. Um, so yeah, staying in touch with your staff, asking them repeatedly, you know, quarterly, whatever the case may be to find out. Now, whenever you do hire a staff, there's going to be an awkward time, right? Because you're training up staff, whether it's a staff, a front office, back office, whether it's a provider, and you're going to question it right away. You're going to be like, it's, it's almost like when you're um, taking off in a plane, right? You're cruising down and uh, you, you can think of that speed as sort of like the anxiety you have, right? Because you're seeing patients all the time. And you're just like, oh, I need another provider. This is, ah, but I don't know when. Well, that plane takes off. And when it takes off, you feel this little pull down, right? And that's where probably your schedule gets a bit lighter. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh crap, I made the wrong decision. You're like, oh, this is not good. You know, now we don't have full schedules. What's this, you know, I'm paying this person. And if you're the person being hired, you're gonna feel that stress because you're like, I'm not doing enough, but the plane does rise, right? You just have to give it some time. You hope to have the systems in place once again to have those patients coming in. And so if you are looking at providers, it's a matter of, well, how many new patients do I get per month? You know, you need some data to back this up as well. Not just do I have money in the bank account. Uh, that's not, you know, it's an easy way to run a practice, but not a good way to run a practice. Uh, so you need to start tracking your data about your new patient acquisition and what your kind of long-term projections are. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great answer. And it kind of segues into the next, um, the next question as we're thinking of data. Is there data that, that you're aware of, um, and this question's for either of you, that shows how well calling versus texting versus emailing for um, appointment confirmations works. Brian, do you have data yeah. on that? Uh, no good data there. I, I will say that um, a very high percentage of patients do respond to email, text, call messaging. Uh, some of it depends on your area. So for example, we work some clinics that are more rural areas that maybe internet connection isn't as great. And so they use the call messaging. So phone rings, automated message saying you have an appointment, the state and time, push one to confirm, right? Um, but it, you know, I, I mentioned that clinic before that uses all online scheduling. They also, of course, use confirmations. They make zero confirmation calls. Um, and particularly with the patient population they work with, you know, you get a text, you reply with yup. I mean, literally, you can reply with yup, and uh, it confirms in the schedule. So um, it, it can be really effective. Clinics that I, I talk to clinics frequently that they had a staff member who spent, like maybe multiple clinics, they spent most of their day calling patients for confirmations. And they were really reticent to kind of back away from that. Oh, it's that connection. We really need to calm, you know. They started, you know, using automated, you know, confirmations. And they found in this case, it was probably in the 70 to 80 percent of appointments were confirmed through the automated methods. So they still were making some calls, but all of a sudden that person instead of spending like all day on, on the phone, making the same thing over and over and over again, was spending a fraction of that time. And now they had a staff member who could actually do work like more outbound calling. So now this person was calling out regarding warranty expiration. They were calling tests not treated patients. They were following up with patients who were fit three weeks ago and checking in to see how they're doing. So it's using that patient's phone skills, but for much more proactive versus sort of a reactive with, with uh, appointment confirmation. So no really solid data there, but I can tell you those methods are, are highly effective. Excellent. Yeah, I would agree. Our clinic uses auto confirmations and we have cut our administrative time significantly with that. Um, and I think our current rate is right around 80% are confirmed that way. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then in terms of cancellations, over time, do you start to get a sense of, you know, you have so many you have so many cancellations per week or per day that you sort of backfill somehow where maybe somebody's on standby or is it just always very erratic with cancellations that you could never really count on it enough to be able to fill that in? It's kind of like the overselling that airlines mm -hmm. do with seats sort of a thing. Is that something that providers do as well or not really? States, you guys do that? Dr. Baldwin, sorry. We really don't. We we do have a wait list. So if someone cancels, mm -hmm. you know, early in the morning for the afternoon or maybe the day before, we always have a running wait list where we can get people in. We do not really double book or anything of that nature. Um, but our cancellations, once we put into place some pretty pretty firm cancellation policies, our cancellations went way down. Um, we 
first off, if a patient does cancel in our clinic, for pretty much all of our providers, they're going to be waiting about two weeks before they can get back in. So they they realize pretty quick if they call in to cancel or if they don't show up and then they call back to reschedule, they're going to be waiting several weeks. And so that's kind of helped with it. And then our longer appointments, you know, such as our vestibular appointments that tie up two to three hours of someone's time, those actually do have cancellation fees that if they don't give us at least 48 hours notice, they're going to actually have a fee att attached to it. So for us, we don't really have that much of an issue. I know in other clinics, it's kind of a, a problem, but for us, we basically just run a waiting list. And if someone cancels with enough time for us to call someone and fill it, we will, but we don't double book with the concern that, you know, someone might not show up because then we wouldn't have a way to see both when they both show up. Right. And once again, the systems you put in place can help a great deal with that. So if there are, you know, automated confirmations going out 48 hours before the appointment, one of the biggest reasons patients cancel is that they forgot. Right. So how are we staying in touch with them beforehand and giving them something that they can refer to? For example, uh, the email confirmations can have a meeting um, uh, attachment to it. Right. So it automatically adds to their Google Calendar. Okay, great. It's on my calendar. You know, I, yeah, and they can set it so they get a reminder the day before. So um, there's things you can do to really help on the vestibular side of things. I totally agree. Uh, those cancellations can be really painful. So you want to have some things in place. And vestibular may be an example where you supplement the automated methods and you do call because maybe you want to confirm, have you taken Meclizine in the last 24 hours, right? So if, if they are going to cancel for some reason, you can work, you work to get that filled in. Right, you can get new patients in, or get fittings in, or or cleaning checks, or whatever it is. Go off that wait list. Um, so hopefully you can minimize as much as possible and then fill. But yeah, double double booking probably wouldn't be probably wouldn't be preferable. Thank you. That's that's helpful. And then the next two questions uh, sort of go together um, a little bit, and that is, uh, do do some practices try to schedule? Uh, similar appointment types in blocks. So when we talk about block scheduling, are, are do we have are there providers who want to do like you know diagnostic testing at a certain point during the week and then maybe do fittings and maybe do some you know other things at different times or do or is it just kind of a you know mix up every day in terms of the kinds of services that are delivered per provider? Um, so I can tell you in our clinic, it is a little bit of a mix up. It would be very rare for us to have say like all day Mondays is diagnostics for one person and all day Tuesday is hearing aid fittings because you'll find patients who say, gosh, I'm only off on Mondays, which means they mm -hmm. have to come in for their diagnostic test on a Monday and their fit on a Monday. So I would recommend you stay clear of saying, you know, huge blocks of time are only for one type of thing, um, but maybe having a mix where throughout the course of a week, you have at least some new patients each day, at least some new patients are morning and some are afternoon, um, so that you've got kind of a good flow. So I think that works a lot easier than block scheduling. That said, mm -hmm. if you have two providers and two rooms and each room can only do certain types of appointments, you may have to consider saying, okay, well, on Monday mornings, I do oral rehab and fittings, and on Monday afternoons, I do testing, and then on Tuesdays, we flip it or something like that so that you're using your resources appropriately. Um, so I, I guess it is still kind of a mix to some extent. Dr. Mm -hmm. Urban? Yeah, the main thing I would avoid is, is having all cleaning checks or all six-month follow-ups um, because that's it's really easy to get into that, and then you look at your schedule and go, you know, particularly if you're in a bundled model, um, where the patient pays, you know, at the time of the fitting for essentially one, two, three years of care. Um, you might look at your schedule for the day and say, I have no revenue generating visits today. And that's not great, obviously. Uh, if you're unbundled, then that's different, right? Because then you can look at those essentially as, as you know, potentially kind of billable hours. Um, but so in general, you'd want to probably avoid that. If you've got four new patients in a row, you're going to be tired at the end of the day, but it's, it's a pretty cool day. Uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't back off from that. <laughs> Thank you. That's a that's a great way to look at it. Um, and then the next question is um, for practices that do have multiple providers in the same practice. Um, are there situations where the the patient would be assigned like to the first available audiologist, depending on the service, or is it something where you would always try to keep the same patient with the same audiologist or provider um, that they've been seeing over time? Uh, Dr. Urban, do you want me to jump in or you want? Yeah, go cool for that one. Yeah, I have some thoughts, but yeah, please. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a big, that is a big question and an ongoing conversation. 
I think it's going to come down to a couple different things. And um, one of them is going to be compensation. Um, there are some practices that are primarily commission based. And if that is the case, there is going to be a lot bigger concern with you giving someone else's patient, you know, quote unquote, someone else's patient to another provider. Um, so one of the reasons, and I don't mind sharing, you know, our practice is not a commission based practice. And it's for this very reason. When a patient calls in, if it's one of my patients, my schedule books up. I've been with the practice over 15 years. So people might have to wait a couple weeks to see me sometimes for longer appointments. So our staff will ask them, hey, Dr. Baldwin's first available is the 14th. Would you like to take that appointment? Or, you know, if this is something you need to have done sooner, we can certainly get you in with someone else. Um, you know, maybe in three days. So in our office, we do try to keep you with your, your provider primarily just for continuity of care. I know their case. I know why they're fit a certain way. I know things that we've tried. But if it's something that's urgent, then our administrative staff, they do have the sort of authority to schedule them with someone else and get them in quicker. But that is a very big important part of how we designed our, our overall practice model versus some other clinics are going to be, you know, that compensation piece is going to be a bigger concern. Sure. And in general, um, with the conversation points, a very, very good point. If putting that aside, uh, some of it's just how you communicate with patients. So I went from being a sole provider to eventually having three audiologists in the practice. And especially we went to from one to two, it's like, oh, the patients, they won't want to see. This is not going to be good. They're going to be really mad. You know, they're going to oh, no, 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 they have to see me. It's about my service. And what I realized, if you hire good people, right? You train them. It's about how you approach it with the patient. So a lot of times if they were seeing a different audiologist than me, um, uh, they might, the first time they might go, oh, I thought I was seeing Brian, you know? Uh, but they'd say like, oh no, you know, my name's Dr. Jones. I've been working with Brian now for, si for six months, Dr. Irvin, whatever. Um, and blah, blah, blah. And it was fine. It was really, really fine. You know, there were a few patients that maybe had a specific preference. In that case, you, you typically note something in their in their you know uh, online profile, and then you make sure. Um, but otherwise, uh, as long as they're getting good care, you know, a lot of times I would catch patients on the way out and say hi to them anyway, because um, ADA took up so much of my time, so <laughs> I had other things to do, um, but in a wonderful way. Uh, but uh, it's just about how you communicate with patients about that. And you have to change your perspective on, I'm the only one that can do this, and hopefully you've hired someone good that you know can work with those patients as well. Thank you. Um, and then the last question that I have, um, and really it's for each of you, and that is um, when you are, are thinking about whether or not it might be time to, to take the next step or try something different with staff in terms of maybe hiring for a position or maybe training somebody up into a different position. What are the kinds of resources that you look at, like from an HR standpoint, that sort of help you as you're considering those aspects that maybe not related to audiology specifically, but that perhaps a, a young professional could look at as they're thinking about building just a staff in general? Um, I might take it on first, if you don't mind, Dr. Baldwin. Yeah, yeah please um, do. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say ADA has a ton of resources um, because that is a challenge, right? So you're trying to train somebody up to maybe manage staff and so you want them to uh, learn more HR stuff or they're going to work closely with the accountant and you want to learn QuickBooks uh, or building coding reimbursement, those types of things. Those are all very kind of highly specialized. Or on the staff side, uh, maybe you, you, you have a, an audiologist you hired and they, they enjoy it in his rehab, and it's something that maybe you haven't had in the practice, but you're looking at expanding. Um, there are certainly resources there as well. So um, ADA is a great starting point. Um, I think Small Business Association has a lot of uh, resources as well uh, to kind of help with that. You can go to like Khan Academy. You know, there's different stuff. You know, the manufacturers will have modules. The buying groups will probably have stuff as well. Uh, that's up to you. Some of that can be really, really great. I don't mean to, to poo-poo it. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, I'm gonna vet it first. I'll just put it that way. Uh, but some of them, you know, some of the buying groups, some of the manufacturers, they put a lot of time, a lot of effort into the kind of quality of the resources there. Uh, but I would always kind of err on the side of getting a wide spectrum of stuff. Um, and then, and then uh, you also don't want to totally divest yourself from the process. You don't want to just say like, hey, you're going to do this. I'm going to step back and we'll see what happens in a few months. You, you probably want to be some degree involved with that. So you're learning too. 
because uh, that's going to help their learning process and it's just going to help, uh, I guess, everyone along the way. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with all of those points. I think don't become disconnected. We we make most of our decisions on a trial basis. And so with, with our new hires and then also if we are looking at changing someone's role, we usually approach it from some some form of a trial period where we both get to assess it. So, you know, the employee and maybe the management, we will provide some kind of review or follow up, say maybe 30 days in or 60 days in or maybe 90 days, just depending on what that is, and then make sure that it's working for both parties. <clears throat> Thank you. That's really, really helpful. And the only thing I, I would add from just from an ADA standpoint for the people who are on the line is that um, you can always feel free to reach out to headquarters. And I personally would like to thank Dr. Urban and Dr. Baldwin for this great insight tonight. But I have also uh, connected people with those practices or those resources and hundreds of others. So if you know kind of the types of questions you have about a staffing structure, I will do my best at headquarters as will the rest of the team to try to find a practice that's similar um, and so that we could find maybe somebody who could answer your question one-on-one -on -one, um, from a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring standpoint because some of these things are very, very specific types of questions depending on what types of services you'd be offering. Um, the location of your practice, if you're in an urban area, suburban area, um, part of the country, that sort of a thing. So we will always do our best to try to connect you with somebody who can answer um, things that are super specific. So um, with that, um, I, I thank you both, Dr. Baldwin, Dr. Urban, for, um, for again, those great presentations. Um, and we are out of time actually for today's session and out of questions. Um, but if you do think of any others, please send them to me at info at audiologist.org. We'll be glad to forward the questions to each presenter. Um, and if you have friends and colleagues that were unable to attend today, um, please let them know that we have recorded the session and we will send a link out to attendees after that's posted. And uh, I would like to also thank Kate Witham and her team. They are doing a fantastic job getting captioning and getting signing to go along with each of these sessions as well. So we really appreciate that. Um, for information about future SATA practice management webinars and to register, please visit audiologist.org backslash students. That's where you'll also find these recordings. So I'd like to thank everyone again and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks.